Chapter 18. The Invitation Rowan tried calming Vasilka. She held her hands up, non-threatening, telling the golem they would not hurt her if she didn't hurt them. I want to see Daddy, Vasilka said, clenching her fists. Her hair was disheveled, and her dress torn, but the rest of her was almost pristine. Irina, on the other hand, had a black eye, bloodied lip, and bruises forming on her cheek. Her sword was still poised, ready to fight the golem again. We don't want any more trouble, Rowan said. Me no want hurt pretty face, Vasilka said, pointing to Irina. Daddy want it. I'm keeping my face, Irina said through gritted teeth. Just then the doors to the abbey opened, and Henry and Navarra walked in. Irina ran up to Henry and hugged him. Where Daddy? Vasilka asked. He's not coming back, Navarra said. Me no fight? Not against us. Is the abbot? Rowan dragged a finger across her throat, not wanting to say the word dead in front of the golem. Henry and Navarra both nodded. You're free, Vasilka, Navarra said. No more bad man to hurt you. Me no marry husband? Daddy want, but me no want husband. You don't need to marry anyone, Navarra said confidently. You're a free person now. Vasilka's eyes lit up, and she clapped her hands with glee. Footsteps thumped on the stairs, and Rowan readied her staff. A woman with long dark curls came down, gliding her hand along the railing. She stopped at the bottom step when she saw the five of them. Navara, Henry, and Irina raised their weapons, poised to attack. The woman immediately drew her own blade and took up a defensive stance. "'Well, you're a jumpy lot, aren't you?' she said with a Vistani accent. "'Who are you, and what are you doing here?' Rowan demanded. "'I'm just passing through. Name's Esmeralda.' She sported a burgundy frock coat and wore a laced knee-high boot on one leg. Her short breeches showed off the other leg, a decoratively carved wooden prosthetic. She looked like a jaunty swashbuckler, who would have been more at home among the buccaneers of the Azure Coast, though the bright scarf on her head resembled the Vistani fashion. "'Nobody is just passing through,' Rowan said. "'I could say the same for you.' Esmeralda glanced at the toppled chairs, bloody floor, and broken window. I came down to see what all the ruckus was about. Are you a friend of the abbot? Henry asked, his sword blazing. No. Like I said, I'm just passing through. Stay in here at the abbey while I search the valley. I'm looking for someone. Who? Rowan asked. A man named Rudolf van Richten. We know him, Navarra blurted out. Rowan shot her a scolding glare. Undeterred, Navara glared back at Rowan and said, He's a friend of ours. Esmeralda lowered her weapon. He's a friend of mine too. We used to travel together for a time. Really? Rowan narrowed her eyes in suspicion. Because the Van Richten I know doesn't travel with anyone, especially not with Vistani. I didn't travel with him for long, Esmeralda said. He doesn't like having anyone around because he says he's cursed, and I can understand why he doesn't like my people. They sold his son into slavery. But I'm not like that. Van Richten and I fought many monsters together, from the docks of Waterdeep to the mountains of Noricum. But it's been a while since I've seen him. When I heard he was hunting the greatest vampire of them all, well... I knew I needed to come to Barovia. How did you remember Barovia when you were outside the mist? Henry asked. I'm Vistani. The curse doesn't keep us from remembering, nor do the mists hinder us from coming and going. I suppose that's why some of my people still respect Count Strahd von Zarevich. Not me. But now that I've told you about myself, I have a few questions for you. Rowan sat with the others at a large dining table. She scarfed down some bread and cheese that they had found in the pantry, 
watching and listening as the others ate and talked with Esmeralda. Henry had used magic to heal his wounds, but he still looked exhausted. An agitated feeling nagged at Rowan, and she let it fester for a while. She didn't know why she felt troubled. Maybe it was because she should have brought her coffin rather than leave it at the winery with the Martikoffs. Maybe it was this abbey. It was unsettling, even with the abbot gone. Maybe it was because Navarra was braiding Vasilka's hair like they were friends. Though the warlock was still bruised from the golem's punches, Navarra treated the perverse creation with affection. Vasilka herself was a disquieting sight, with her symmetrical face, buxom figure, and ivory skin. She looked like a Blinsky doll come to life. And then there was Henry and Irina, who had become irritatingly close recently. But why should any of these things bother Rowan to such a degree? She gripped her staff, longing for some relief, and recalled that she had been having similar feelings ever since coming back to life in the graveyard. Rowan returned to the conversation when Henry and Navarra told Esmeralda about the abbot and how they had killed him. The Vistana applauded. "'Well, you lot are dangerous buggers,' Esmeralda said, "'killing him outright. I knew that abbot was up to no good, but I wasn't about to cross blades with him.' "'What mean killing?' Vasilka asked. "'It means the abbot is never going to hurt you again,' Navarra said. "'There, all done.' Navarra let the golem feel the finished braid. "'Me pretty?' the golem asked. "'Absolutely gorgeous,' Navarra said, then turned to Henry with a look of excitement. "'Can I see the sword?' "'I'd like to see it too.' Rowan said, with similar enthusiasm. Did I hear you right the first time? Is it really the sword of Sergei von Zerovich? Henry drew the weapon, and it filled the hall with light. It wasn't as bright as it had been when Henry fought the abbot, but its splendor was no less extraordinary. He handed it to Navarra and told them about Apollo. His soul was trapped in that jar for about four hundred years, Henry said, and God only knows how his blade ended up stuck in a rock outside Blackford. Wow, a sentient weapon, Navarra said, stroking the blade with care. It's amazing you can communicate with it. What's Apollo saying now? Henry's mouth turned down. Um, you don't want to know. Just stop petting it like that and let Rowan see it. Navarra handed the sword to Rowan. The druid held it reverently. She was surprised how balanced it felt, despite its length. Regardless of what Henry had said about it before, insisting that it was old and ordinary, Rowan had always thought the sword was impressive. But the sunlight made it one of a kind. She gave it back to the knight. "'So, what are you doing in Barovia, anyway?' Esmeralda asked, eyes fixed on Apollo. Aside from killing angels, that is. It's a long story, Rowan said. But the short of it is, we want to free Barovia from its curse. You can't do that without killing the Lord of Ravenloft, the Vistana said with a wry smile. That was my plan before you came and fucked it up. I was going to do it right here at the Abbey. When I found out Count Strahd was coming to Kresik to meet the Abbot two days from now, I planned to trap him in a magic circle and fight him away from his lair. I've heard of magic circle, said Navarra, but how could that kill Strahd? It can't kill him, but if the circle is cast right, it should hold a vampire and prevent him from charming anyone. Clever, Rowan said. I thought so too, said Esmeralda. But who knows if Strahd will show himself? now that the abbot is dead. Do you think Strahd will find that out within two days? Irina asked in concern. The Vistana put an elbow on the table and leaned in. The Dark Lord has spies everywhere, whether you see them or not. I would be surprised if he doesn't know by tonight. Rowan and Irina exchanged a look of dread. 
Speaking of spying, Navara said, through a mouthful of food. She swallowed. We suspected the Vistani are watching us by scrying. Do you think they'd really do something like that for Strahd? Sure, most of my people are loyal to the Count, Esmeralda said, tapping a finger on the table. They'll do anything for him. Rowan didn't know how scrying worked, but imagined it was like peering into a crystal ball. If they did use the horse's hair as a medium, she hoped the only scene they could see now was Snowflake and Juniper taking a dump in their stalls. Of course, the spies probably watched them travelling. Likely they knew Rowan and the others were in Kresik. Why would they help us, then? Rowan asked. It was your leader, Madame Eva, who sent us on a mission to stop Strad. Why would she do that if the Vistani work for him? Don't you remember, Rowan? Navara asked. Stanimir and the Vistani long for their prince to be free of his curse. The prince is obviously Strad. If we can lift the curse from Barovia, everyone will be free. Everyone but the Count, Esmeralda said. I don't know what Madame Eva told you, but the only way to help Barovia is to kill the one who brought about the curse in the first place. We know, Henry said, and we will. But there are a few things we need to do first. Yes, Navarra agreed, and next on the list is Berez. Rowan recalled Navarra telling them that there might be a fane at the ruined village of Berez, and Davian had told them there was a group of standing stones there. By the way, Navarra said after swallowing another bite, why is Strahd called the Count if he's really a prince? And if his father is dead, shouldn't he be a king? I think you're misunderstanding how titles relate to land and blood, Esmeralda explained. Strahd is a prince by virtue of his royal birth. He's also a count because of his lordship over the county of Barovia. But he can't rightfully be called a king because he was never crowned in the royal throne at Castle Virginia. It is beyond the mist. He can never be king while he remains trapped in this cursed valley. Otto came into the room, his posture bent and his eyes searching for his master. Henry finished his meal and wiped his hands, carelessly sprinkling breadcrumbs on the floor. He told Otto that the abbot was no longer in charge, and that he was never coming back. The mutant scratched his head, confused, and asked who would take care of the mongrel folk. Henry looked to the others. The burgomaster will be in for a shock when we tell him he's in charge of all the mutants in that madhouse. How many are there? Rowan asked, not sure if she wanted an answer. If it's anything like my dreams, and I'm afraid it will be, then there are at least fifty. We should go over there to the other building just to see. But I warn all of you, it's disturbing. It was indeed disturbing. Rowan had to pinch her nose as soon as she walked into the madhouse, but even then the fetid odor lingered in her nostrils. In the eight prison-like chambers, mutants the size of goblins ate, slept, and defecated. They were filthy, loud, and more unsettling to look at than goblins. They were misshapen, with various humanoid and animal body parts, altogether unnatural. Some of them skulked in corners, mumbling gibberish, while others sang and watched their companions dance to their incoherent nonsense. Each chamber housed five to ten mongrels, and each creature within was just as hideous and vile as the last. Rowan wondered how Henry had stayed sane, night after night, of witnessing this abomination. When they brought Baron Kreskov to the abbey and introduced him to the mongrels, he abruptly turned on his heels and ran out, gagging. "'I don't know what to do with those... those monsters!' he said after he composed himself in the courtyard. That will be something you have to figure out, Henry said. In the meantime, Otto, Siegfried, and Vasilka seem competent enough to take care of them. Me no like mongrels, Vasilka said, hiding behind Navara. 
those monsters aside, I just can't believe you... you killed the abbot. Dmitri pulled at his white beard. Do you have any idea the repercussions of your actions, the unintended consequences? You've just told me the abbot was planning to meet with Strahd to give him a, a, a bride? What will the vampire do when he finds out what you've done? I'll tell you what he'll do. He shook his finger at Henry. He'll take it out on us townsfolk. We could become the next Berez. Listen, Burgomaster, Henry said in a calm tone. There was no good option. That angel had been up here for years, experimenting with lives and torturing innocent people. I, for one, could not stand by and watch it go on. Navarra also tried to console the Burgomaster, telling him that what was done was done, and that he needed to be strong for his people. Even though she did not use magic, her words had a calming effect, and Dmitri invited them to stay one more night at his house. "'But that's it,' he said firmly. "'I want all of you out of Kresik by tomorrow morning.' Before leaving the abbey, Henry asked Esmeralda if she wanted to join them. "'You seem capable enough,' he said. "'We're going to Berez to find a hag named Baba Lasagna.' "'Lisaga,' Navarra corrected. Esmeralda declined. "'I've no interest in looking for a hag in a swamp. "'I'm hunting bigger game,' she said. "'Besides, if you say Van Richten went to a tower west of Velaki, "'I'll bet it's the old necromancer's tower. "'That's where I should go. "'But I wish you luck. "'Let me know when you decide to go after the big catch. "'I'll be happy to join you if I haven't already beat you to the punch. Rowan hadn't seen Esmeralda in a fight, but she doubted the Vistana could bring down Strahd single-handed. In the afternoon, Rowan, Irina, and Navarra headed back to the Burgomaster's house, while Henry helped Dmitri bring a few guards to watch the abbey. Why did the abbot have so many mongrel folk? Rowan wondered. Otto and Siegfried told them the mongrels were members of the diseased Bellevue family, and that the abbot had been making them better. Rowan could not imagine any disease worse than what those creatures were suffering now. The only comfort Rowan got out of her conversation with the Bellevues was when she briefly talked to Siegfried. The cat-faced, lizard-scaled mutant was going on and on about her miserable ugliness. Rowan disagreed and told her that cats and lizards were fabulous creatures. Then Rowan had transformed into a cat, then a lizard. Siegfried still grumbled, but the mutant smiled when she thought no one was looking. That night, Henry would probably have no dreams. He would probably snuggle up in his bedroll by the fire and rest assured that his demon was dead. It was ironic that his demon had turned out to be an angel. But weren't demons really fallen angels anyway? Rowan was no cleric and did not have time to contemplate the matter, as she was pulled into another nightmare by her own demons. Again, Rowan stood before the great column of golden stone. Amber. Yes, that's what it was. She remembered that her father used to wear an amber crystal on a pendant. Again she saw the dark, enigmatic shape deep within the stone. Again she reached out to touch it. Again Vampyr spoke to her in a voice more silent than the grave. Rowan, I hold the answers you seek. I know how your parents met and loved each other. I know how your mother learned her magic. I know how your father became a vampire. I know why he killed your mother. I know how he smuggled you out of Barovia. And I know where you can find him now. Only speak my name aloud, and all this knowledge will be yours. The dream changed. Rowan and her mother were running through the woods. 
Rowan gasped for air. She had never run so hard in her life, and her little legs couldn't keep up with Sariel's leaping strides. Glancing back at her daughter, Sariel shouted, Come on, Rowan! Run! We can't stop now! Completely exhausted, Rowan tripped on a tree root and did not get up. Rowan! Sariel rushed to her daughter and fell to her knees. Get up, Rowan! Get up! There's no time to argue! Get up! Rowan was scared. She had never heard her mother's voice tremble with fear before, and the experience was unnerving. But her lungs were burning like a furnace, and her legs felt like jelly. I can't, Mama. I'm sorry, I can't. Tears streamed down Rowan's face. At that moment, a wolf's howl pierced the air. Another howl answered it. They were getting closer. Sariel put a finger to her lips. Shh! Hush, Rowan. Now listen carefully. I will cast a spell to hide you. Don't move and don't make a sound. If the spell fades, do not come looking for me. You turn into a small animal and hide. Don't show yourself to anyone, not even to me. Do you understand? Not to anyone. Sariel shook her daughter's shoulders until Rowan nodded that she understood. Then she clasped the little girl's head tight against her bosom in one last embrace. Be brave, Rowan. I love you. After whispering an incantation and gesticulating her fingers in the air, Sariel transformed into a hind and bounded away into the forest. Rowan remained, crouched within an illusory tree trunk, quivering and crying. Again the dream changed. Rowan's father was sprinting through the forest, weaving between trees with the inhuman speed of a vampire. He reached a small village in a clearing and stopped abruptly. A ghastly scene greeted him. Bodies and parts of bodies were scattered like leaves driven by a storm. Here a length of intestine dangled from a low-hanging branch. There a severed head stared back with vacant eyes. A splattering of bright red covered almost every surface. The blood was fresh. But apart from the slow crackling of a campfire, all was quiet. Metis's face seized with panic. Sariel! he cried. There was no answer. He rushed among the bodies, searching frantically. Sariel! Sariel! His screams became shrill with increasing urgency. He ducked into each of the small thatched huts, emerging each time more anxious than before. Sariel! Dropping to all fours, Metis sniffed the ground in a wide circle around the clearing. Suddenly, his back stiffened and his head jolted upright, looking out into the woods. For one moment, a flicker of hope stole across the vampire's face. Then he tore off into the underbrush, running like he'd never run before. Rowan! Rowan! Rowan awoke to Navara's gentle hands on her shoulders. Rowan, you were calling out! Rowan sat up and shivered. Night was still upon them, and Rowan did not know how to process what she had just seen. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to, Navara said. I saw my father, Rowan said at once. He was running after my mother. She and I were hiding. I remember hiding. And I always thought we were hiding from him. But now I don't know. Rowan told the dream to Navara, recalling it all with vivid detail. When she finished, she looked to the warlock. Navara put a finger to her chin. Something terrible happened. But it didn't seem like your father was the cause of it. He seemed worried that your mother would be among the dead. It almost seemed like... Like... Like he cared for her, Rowan finished. But vampires can't really love. Right, Rowan? Rowan did not know any more. The dreams felt so real. As Navara lay down in her bedroll and fell back to sleep, Rowan blinked at the ceiling, thinking. She stayed awake, 
picturing her father and his desperate cries for her mother. When dawn came, the others awoke, ready to travel to Berez. After breakfast, they went to the stables and saddled the horses. They bade farewell to Dmitri, Anna, Milivaj, and the children. Rowan could only hope the burgomaster was wrong about Strahd's impending wrath. The cold bit her face as they rode toward the gate. Here in the mountains, she almost forgot it was still autumn. But as soon as they passed the stone gatehouse, a tumble of recently fallen leaves blew across the road, reminding her. Good morning, travellers. In the middle of the lane, about fifty feet from the gate, sat an elf astride a shadowy grey steed. His dark skin, his black hair, the scar on his forehead. He was the man she had seen in her dreams, praying before Mother Night. Rowan stiffened and touched the staff at her side. When the man saw Rowan, he sneered with loathing, as though she were repugnant like the mongrel folk. I am Rahadin, he said in the distinctive accent of the Dusk Elves. I am Chamberlain of Berovia, brother and servant of Count Strad von Zarevich. He extended his hand to Henry, holding out a sealed letter. The knight looked at the envelope with wary eyes. It is an invitation to dine with the Count at Castle Ravenloft. Henry slowly reached out and took the letter. Then he opened it and read aloud. My friends, know that it is I who have brought you to this land, my home, and know that I alone can release you from it. I bid you dine at my castle so that we can meet in civilized surroundings. Your passage here will be a safe one. I await your arrival. Your host, Strad von Zarevich. When Henry finished, Rahadin tightened the reins on his steed and turned to leave. My lord expects to see the four of you very soon, and the new burgomaster of Valaki, what was his name, Vasily von Holtz, he is expected to come as well. How soon? Henry asked. When does the count expect us to come? If I were you, I would arrive no later than four evenings from now. Rahadin gave Rowan one last look of utter disgust, then walked his horse off the road, heading east into the woods. Wait, Rowan said. She dismounted from Juniper and ran up to the Chamberlain, out of earshot from her friends. You look at me as though you know me, as though I had offended you. Why? Rahadin looked down his nose at her, while his horse foamed at the bit striking impatient hooves against the ground. Your existence offends me. Rowan shook her head, at a loss. She was a dusk elf like him. Why should he hate her for being alive? Maybe he knew she was a dampier, or maybe because she was female. Studying his features, she couldn't help but think of her father. Who are you really? She needed to know. But Rahadin said nothing. He did not look at her after that. Instead, he turned his horse and continued to ride until he disappeared under the shadows of the dark trees.